Hi, I'm Katie Sullivan and just a normal American woman. But to the left, that makes me a cisgendered ethno-imperialist birthing person with pronouns she, her. Words like that are quite a mouthful and it's one America needs to spit out before we choke on it. In the eyes of many in the world, this every four year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. Only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. Whether we go forward together with courage or turn back to policies that weakened our economy, diminished our leadership in the world, America's future will be in your hands. Bethany, are your children afraid of monsters in the attic or under the bed? Yeah, they have been, but we always tell them that they do not exist. Today we have news. There are monsters in Uncle Sam's attic. It's the words, phrases, definitions that are used, which may look like one thing, but absolutely mean another. And it is scary. During this training, we will identify the problem, discuss examples from our time in the federal government, as well as the five cross-cutting principles of the current administration. We will teach you how to unwind the words and phrases that have been so artfully layered into every document in the federal government. You can do this in any role at any level of seniority. This training will prepare you to make changes and fast. The left continually pivots and assaults definitions and phrases. They twist words and phrases to support subconscious acceptance of a philosophy that was rejected or is against the grain of human existence, like what is a woman? Perhaps the most effective tool the left wields is their ability to engage in constant subliminal advertising through their narrative, words, and phrases. Marxism became socialism, then democratic socialism, and is now represented by the terms social justice and equity. This is perhaps the most scary of all. Katie, what brings to mind is the quote, he who controls the language rules the world. It's attributed to Joseph Stalin and other tyrants. And George Orwell stated, he who controls language controls culture. Even more, Hitler and others lived by the creed. If you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it. Without doubt, it's true. Language is a powerful and often controlling tool. Career bureaucrats and the left are also using language to change culture and gain more and more authority, thereby upsetting the balance of power envisioned by our founding fathers. This in essence, weaponized language against the American people. This training is vital to you as a political appointee. If there's one thing you take from this training, it is to know when you start your job as a political appointee, every single word, phrase, and acronym must be vetted and you must determine what implications every word has before publishing or moving forward with any official or internal document. All right. So now that we have identified the problem, let's give the viewers a taste of what we saw in the Trump administration. Bethany and I were both part of a coordinated effort in the Trump administration focused on trying to take back hijacked language and definitions across the United States government and even at our engagements in the United Nations. From our experiences, we will teach you how to identify the left's progressive language, scrutinize career staff compositions for dangerous language, and how to combat their manipulative efforts 
ensuring clarity of definition and conservative intention. Bethany and I are going to give you some examples of what we mean by this need to always ensure clarity, but in no way are we able to foresee the future and anticipate how the progressive left will continue to co-opt even more words and definitions. We can tell you the words and phrases being used today, but by the time you enter the administration, these examples may be obsolete. This will help you spot crucial issue areas to pay close attention to. We do not know what they will be calling men and women by the time you begin your tenure with the administration. The left is trying to dismantle America and rebuild it in their own image by using the art of deception and words and definitions are their weapon of choice. Remember, words change culture. Bethany, with your extensive experience with both domestic and international policy issues, and in light of your role in, a lead, in leadership positions at USAID, can you walk us through some examples of how the left uses words, weaponizes really, words and definitions? Uh, and if you could do that in a context of the cross-cutting issues that are identified and the mandate for leadership, uh, and, and really, as we understand, the cross-cutting issues were identified because they are the pillars of the Biden administration. And so they've been layered into virtually every document in the federal government. If you could walk us through some of those examples, I think it would be incredibly helpful. I'd be happy to, absolutely. The five topic areas for today's discussion are centered on women, children, and family, environment, human rights and border security, the gender cult, and equity. The first topic, women, children, and family. I worked on international issues and very closely followed the language presented at the United Nations. And I saw up close and personal how this indeed is true. Language is used to control culture. I'll never forget a conversation I had with the chief of staff at USAID. We are trying to provide alternative language for the highly controversial phrase, comprehensive sexuality education, or CSE, which at the United Nations had come to mean not just typical sex education, but instead had been morphed into teaching and normalizing sex at very early ages, even as young as preschool. And for girls who became pregnant, that abortion was a preferable method of birth control. Back to the conversation with the chief of staff. He suggested several alternatives, but each time I told him that, unfortunately, the, his recommended edit was also interpreted as CSE. Frustrated, he vented. They have literally co-opted the English language. And it was at that moment that I realized that the progressive left is controlling the language, redefining definitions, and by doing so, are ruling the world. On a positive note, despite all the angst that we, we did succeed on that negotiation, DevEx published an article with the headline, No Mention of Reproductive Rights in Declarations Out of G7 Development Ministerial. You can read more about this in the course materials section. Now, let's talk about the word abortion. The left got very creative years ago and started using different words to make abortion sound a little less like murder. For example, sexual and reproductive health, reproductive rights, sexual and reproductive health services, reproductive health services, health services, sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights, sexual and reproductive health and rights. All of these include abortion. For years, we knew that the terms above that I just mentioned had been used and that they were code for abortion. The left and the career bureaucrats at state and USAID told us, oh, no, no, no. But then when I was negotiating with Canada for the G7 development ministerial, I said, well, can we just use these terms and add that does not include abortion? And their response was telling. They said, but it does include abortion. Even with that admission, I had a difficult time convincing political appointees 
that these terms were co-opted. Another example hits closer to home and highlights how imperative it is for political appointees to ensure definitions are correct and explicitly followed. Three days after President Trump took office on January 20th, 2017, he issued a presidential memorandum regarding the Mexico City policy. This became known as the Protecting Life and Global Health Assistance Policy, or the expanded Mexico City policy. When I arrived at USAID in June 2017, I was the first political appointee in a bureau outside the front office and the sixth political appointee in the building. Despite President Trump issuing a presidential memorandum at the very onset of his administration to immediately change course and to protect life, even months later, his guidance was ignored. I remember hearing careers refer to this policy and even seeing documents that referred to it as the global gag order. I immediately told the career staff that we do not refer to it as the global gag order, but instead appropriately as the protecting life and global health assistance policy. To some, it may seem inconsequential, but it actually was completely undermining the president and the American people who had elected President Trump. So opposed to this policy change, the left actually started a new organization and an international movement called She Decides, which invited NGOs and other foreign governments to join and actively promote abortion services and advocacy, essentially joining together to try to counter what the Trump administration was doing to protect life. Language matters. Bethany, it's incredible how the left is able to make killing children and babies a pro-movement. I mean, their narrative is just incredible and so opposite of what the reality of the situation is. We see that also with, uh, with environment, right? So I remember when I was in school, um, in uh, elementary school, we were taught that we were all gonna be frozen over by an ice age, and of course this was terrifying. And then in the 80s, it was acid rain. We were all going to die from the acid rain. And then it moved to global warming, which I think you know most of the people watching this tape will remember. That, wasn't, that was during the Obama administration. Yes. And then science comes along and disproves the global warming theory in large part. And we have one of the most frigid winters ever known. And then the next thing you know, they're calling it climate change. Now, I always understood that climate change meant seasons. Our climate does change all the time, but of course that's not what's meant by the left. What do you think about all of, uh, about the left's words and definitions in, in, in the environment? It's a great point, Katie. They don't stop. Climate change allegedly is everywhere. And if the American people elect a conservative president, his administration will have to eradicate climate change references from absolutely everywhere. And according to our intelligence community, the number one threat facing our country today is, drumroll, climate change. Not Russia, not China, not AI, climate change. This shows how the federal government is all in on this issue. And climate change activists wield a lot of power this is an issue to pay attention to as it has infiltrated every part of the federal government. Now, when I think of climate change, I immediately think of population control, don't you? I think about the people who don't want you to have children because of the impact on the environment. Perhaps not everyone will make that connection, but after spending time in the international space trying to protect life, I can tell you that this is part of their ultimate goal to control people. Let me share a personal example of how the left seeks to permeate every dimension of life through their skewed terminology and definition. When I arrived at USAID, I had a career employee ask me how many children I had. I thought it was a bit odd of a question, but to be kind, I answered and I said, I had three children. And he actually said to me, Oh wow, one and a half too many for the environment. I smiled and I said very politely, if I could have 10 more children, I would. 
The policy book captures the essence of climate change. And I quote, in the name of combating climate change, policies have been used to create an artificial energy scarcity that will require trillions of dollars in new investment supported with taxpayer subsidies to address a problem that government and special interests themselves have created. Page 364, end of quote. Population growth, environmental changes, and weather patterns have all been intertwined by the left. They take or even make up a term and create, extend, and alter the definition to validate whatever ideology or position they want to ingrain and convince others is good, when in reality it's not. Often, as you just heard, they are simply not coherent or logical. Remember, our intelligence community identified climate change as the number one threat to America. So even if you do not work at the Department of Energy, no matter where you work, because of the Biden administration's executive orders and policy priorities, you will have to look for climate change language and get rid of it. Bethany, when you were talking about how the left has co-opted so many words and weaponized so many words when it comes to abortion, and that's something that you know, political appointees in the next administration are going to have to really look at this idea that it's a right. There's many phrases that included rights. Uh, is there other places where rights are used as a catch-all and they actually, it means something else? Katie, that's a great question. And in fact, number three, it's human rights. Human rights in border security. So rights, rights, rights. The left is always coming up with new rights. In the Trump administration, we countered human rights with unalienable rights. The careers went absolutely crazy at USAID. But thankfully, President Trump had established a commission on unalienable rights at the State Department, and we would just point back to the commission. Sadly, our founding documents were not sufficient, but thankfully, the commission was. The Department of State's Commission on Unalienable Rights was charged with providing the U.S. government with advice on human rights grounded in our nation's founding principles and the principles of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, I'm going to turn over border security to you, Katie, as it deals with legalese. And we all know that border security is a major issue and the differences between a conservative presidency and administration and the current administration couldn't be more stark than in this area. So getting the words very precise and correct is crucial. The left has co-opted language and definitions as it relates to immigration. Illegal immigration is one of the most devastating challenges America faces today, particularly when you factor in all of the secondary costs and effects of illegal immigration, including illicit drug and human trafficking. The left knows the American people oppose illegal immigration and understands its effects. So they have spent years using language designed to both conflate uh, le illegal immigration and legal immigration, the latter of which most Americans support, and soften the idea that illegal immigration is, in fact, illegal. It is a good bet that the left has focused group tested and group tested the language it uses to cover up the horrors of illegal immigration. For example, when describing illegal immigration, the left likes to use words and phrases like undocumented immigrants and migrants. These terms are, des are designed to sound softer and take the edge off the fact that these people are illegally in the United States. It is important to note that they specifically avoid using the word alien, which is the terminology used in federal law. To be clear, alien is not a negative or pejorative term. It is a legal term of art. It simply means that an individual is not a citizen of a particular country. 
Language matters here for a lot of reasons, but primarily because citizens of the United States have rights that others, including foreign nationals, who are illegally on our soil do not. If I had to guess, I would say that the left's attempt to wash away the term alien stems from their disdain of actual law since they want to avoid discussion of what federal immigration law actually requires, which is everything they refuse to do, and their interest in washing away the overall value of citizenship. Remember, citizenship places a focus on nationality and sovereignty. The left has bought into the globalist vision of a borderless world and their language choices reflect that. The left loves to say that illegal aliens are undocumented. Not only is that terminology not used anywhere in federal law, but it is clearly designed to soften the concept of illegality by making it seem like it's just a technicality. In other words, if you are undocumented, it makes it sound like you can be here legally, but you're missing a few pieces of bureaucratic paperwork. That is simply not the case. If an alien has not gone through the appropriate process for obtaining a visa to enter the United States or otherwise followed United States law to enter the United States, they are illegally here. Period. Hard stop. Calling illegal aliens undocumented immigrants is the intellectual equivalent of calling someone who breaks into your house in the middle of the night an undocumented homeowner. It is inaccurate and it is designed to be inaccurate. The term migrants or migration are just as deceptive. The left likes to use migrants and migration not only because it sounds gentle, but it also creates confusion. When people hear these terms, they know deep down that migration is seasonal and circular. They think of birds or butterflies. They fly south, they fly north, and so on. And historically, we have had foreign nationals come into the United States for seasonal or agricultural work and then return to their home countries. It would be reasonable and accurate to refer to those individuals as migrant workers because they ultimately return home. But make no mistake, the current mass illegal immigration we are seeing as a result of the Biden administration's intentional actions is not migration, and these people are not migrants. It is an orchestrated invasion being led by the Biden administration in conjunction with the Mexican cartels. The bottom line is, we win or lose political fights based on language. If you let the other side of the debate set the terms of the debate, you've already lost. In the context of immigration specifically, we have to start using more accurate language to describe what is going on and pegging our language to existing law. If we can take back the language, here and elsewhere, we will win more of these fights. So Bethany, I mean, these are some great examples. And another one that comes to my mind that has been completely co-opted by the left um, is gender. And I'm, I know you have so much experience uh, in, in the history of your professional life in dealing with this. Where are we today on this issue and the language and the, and the words and the definitions? Let's talk about the word gender. The word gender is no longer a polite way to refer to biological sex, male or female. The word now is completely toxic. It's no longer being used to mean male or female, but now how people identify which is where we get this idea of gender identity. Katie, did you know that there are between 72 and 1,000 different kinds of gender? We should never use the word gender as conservatives. It's not specific and it's nonsensical. Instead, use the word sex or biological sex or male and female. And I don't care where you are in the administration, you will deal with the word gender. 
speaking of sex, the next phrase that we're going to talk about is sex assigned at birth. Now, I just told you to use the word sex, and you may think that sex assigned at birth, that sounds great. Well, actually it's not. It's the left's attempt to change biological fact and to try to normalize their belief that biological sex can change. Unfortunately, many folks, including solid conservatives, have accepted this and don't understand the danger in using this term. In fact, some conservatives have even taken this term and changed it slightly, gender as revealed at birth. The left is infiltrating our conservative organizations, Christian schools, and even churches. We must always be on guard. And when a new term is introduced, ask, what is the genesis for this new term and why was it introduced? If you see the term sex assigned at birth, delete it and replace it with biological sex. The next issue under gender is pronouns. Don't fall into the progressive left's trap in regard to pronouns. Don't use them in email signature blocks, on LinkedIn, and absolutely do not ask people what their pronouns are on your first day on the job. When I was at USAID, managers were giving training and were told that when they have new staff or have a staff meeting, they should go around the room and ask everyone what their pronouns are. Katie, if that happened to you, what would you do? I think political appointees, Bethany, great question, uh, need to expect that they are going to be tested by career staff the day they walk in. So. That question, every political appointee should be prepared to deal with and answer, whether it's in a training. I don't think it'll take that long. It probably will be the first couple days on the job. So a political appointee is empowered. They are empowered because they are absolutely put in the position, whatever level it is, in order to, uh, in order to implement the president's agenda. And that is the business of a political appointee and should be a, the business of all federal employees. So the answer is simple. We're here to implement the president's priorities and agenda. We are not here to discuss pronouns. The next topic is gender affirming care. Gender affirming care and what the Biden administration is promoting is absolutely infuriating especially as for parents. We need to be protecting our children from these harmful, sterilizing puberty blockers, cross sex hormones, and permanent genital mutilation. That's what gender affirming care is, not care at all. The idea that gender is fluid is evil, and it is a major initiative of the Biden administration. It's layered into each and every office document, task force, and funding priority. Perhaps most commonly known are the changes to Title IX giving institutions, schools, control over children and their gender preference, working against parents, mandating boys compete against girls. This is all done with words. Words matter. Change the words, change the culture. Now, Katie, I know that you've written several wonderful pieces on equity and you've done a lot of research on this and the Biden administration has infiltrated equity into everything. What are your thoughts on equity for the next administration? Well, it's a little heart stopping, Bethany, and it's going to take a lot to rewind uh, where we are right now with this um, with the left's definition of equity and how that's layered into all federal government documents. Roger Severino states it perfectly in the Project 2025 Mandate for Leadership book, quote, under President Biden, the mission has shifted from promoting equity in everything we do, end quote, for the sake of, quote, populations sharing a particular characteristic, including race, sexuality, gender identification, ethnicity, and a host of other categories." End quote. Equity no longer means all men are created equal, the cornerstone of our U.S. Constitution, but rather now mandates the government to dispense with unequal treatment in order to achieve 
what they believe to be equal outcomes. This creates divisiveness, not equality. There is no unification under these principles. It is more of a competition of what class is more of a victim, so that particular class can receive the preferential treatment being handed out and mandated by the Biden administration. It's important to note that the very first executive order that President Biden uh, signed just moments after his inauguration on January 20th of 2021 had to do with equity. The left applauded as Biden announced his number one priority, which is advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities throughout the federal government. As part of that executive order, within 90 days, every single agency had to file an equity action plan with the White House. If you want to see or view what you will be up against, take a look at those plans. They're all online under the Office of Management and Budget. Since that time, nine more executive orders have been executed by the Biden administration about equity. The latest to date is to further advance racial equity. This entails new positions and responsibilities to be embedded into every single agency and office in the federal government. And there is also a directive that all funding that is given out by the federal government prioritize unequal treatment of the American people. The noxious tenets of critical race theory and gender ideology should be excised from curriculum in every single public school in this country. So Katie, this is a lot to absorb. So how do you suggest that we tackle the problem? I know you were the head of a grant office at DOJ and you had a lot of paperwork. What are your suggestions? Well, I found that developing a process for each type of document was crucial to reversing the words and definitions from the Obama administration. Here's an overall strategy to implement. First, look for any OMB, that's the Office of Management and Budget, White House Office of Management and Budget, guidance. You'll want to instruct career employees that you, whatever level you are, you want to be informed of all OMB guidance and how it is being implemented internally. Oftentimes careers will just get an OMB circular or an OMB advice and then they just go along and they either ignore it or they don't put it in. You want to be involved in the process. You want to say, every single thing that comes in, I want to make sure that it is actually being implemented. This can easily be handled at the senior advisor or even special assistant level. The second thing you need to do, and quickly, are look at guidance documents. Now I've talked about this in other trainings. Guidance documents are simply a federal career employee's uh, interpretation of, of a statute, of an appropriation given by Congress, of a rule, a regulation, and how it's going to be implemented. A guidance document is not binding. It is simply, in some ways, just their opinion. The problem with a guidance document is, is that it has a tremendous amount of authority because if you are looking to, to an agency to find out what they're looking for for your grant or how your grant program will be implemented or what rules they have around it, you're going to look at those guidance documents they end up with a tremendous amount of authority. It really ends up being the career's agenda, being uh, forced onto the American people. A court is the only uh, real institution that can give us a definitive interpretation of any kind of uh, grant program, appropriation, or rule. So most likely, 
you will, the Office of Management and Budget will come out very quickly with a plan to take down all the guidance documents that are currently up that reflect uh, the Biden administration's agenda. Uh, so you'll first want to look at that process. The second thing you're going to want to do, sort of the second layer, is to absolutely uh, look at things that may not appear to be guidance documents, but are. For instance, one of the documents on our website uh, was supposedly done by a Rutgers you know, professor, and it, so it looked like it wasn't actually career guidance, but when you really dug into the document, it was not part of any kind of grant program, and it really was just a career who asked a whole bunch of questions, and a Rutgers uh, professor said yes. So it really, in the end, was a guidance document, and we brought it down. Another really frightening example when um, I was running the Office on Violence Against Women was a provision in the Violence Against Women Act that about gender identity. And if you identified as a woman and you showed up at a woman's domestic violence shelter, uh, you had to be accommodated. Um, there were lawsuits, of course, about this as predators used that in order to gain entry into a place where there were vulnerable women. Seemed to me to be exactly opposite of, you know... The intention. Yeah, the intention of the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, in any event, the, it was directed toward just the um, Office on Violence Against Women programs. It was in the Violence Against Women Act. But in the Obama administration, the entire grant-making component of the Office of Justice programs, which I later went on to run, the head of that office actually wrote a guidance document that said that the provision in the Violence Against Women Act regarding to gender identity was, was intended to apply to every single DOJ grant program, that it wasn't limited to the Office on Violence Against Women. There was absolutely no indication that this was true, but you can see that just by getting that particular uh, uh, legislation passed and the way that the careers then interpreted it created a complete change in culture across the Department of Justice. The next step will be to read every single executive order. I would suggest that, you know, starting with an assistant, a special assistant, a senior advisor, that you get every single executive order and put it in a binder and have that binder for the principal and make sure that it's flagged for them. There will be a lot of executive orders that come out and some of them actually, and know this, repeal other executive orders. So you need to then pull the executive orders that are being repealed so you are very clear about what needs to be redacted. Now let's go back to that OMB tip that I gave and just like that you need to be part of the process that the careers are using to implement executive orders. During the Trump administration I can tell you that executive orders were were signed, fully executed, uh, where all the guidance was given. You gave an example of this, Bethany, uh, to our office, and I later found out that it was just simply ignored. It, it, it's not worth you know, the, the price of the paper it's written on if your careers are not implementing what the president wanted. I think you can expect that equity and all of the equity uh, executive orders under Biden will be repealed early in the next administration. This is going to require a very detailed plan to execute the eradication of the dictates in the equity orders. For instance, there's a gender advisor position created by one of these executive orders. 
That position has to be eradicated, as well as all the task forces, the removal of all the um, equity plans from all the websites, and a complete rework of the language in internal and external policy documents and grant applications. Which leads me to grants and rules and regulations. Well, grant and grant programs are funded with your federal tax dollars and they are appropriated by Congress. So you get, you are told how much money you have for what particular program. And typically your appropriations language will just give a very brief description of the program. And that's the direction that Congress has given the agency. Every single grant has conditions. You want to think of this like a carrot and a stick. You can have your federal money in order to support uh, your program, but only if you agree uh, to certain conditions which are built into the grants. When I began at the Office on Violence Against Women, our grant applications were 75 to 110 pages long. Pages and pages of guidance that had no statutory or congressional counterpart and tons of conditions. The conditions that you would need in order to receive the money and you would need to continue to live with those conditions throughout the time of your grant. For instance, to receive grant uh, money, certain programs would have to show a partnership with an LGBTQ support group. There was no language in the appropriation for that grant that an LGBTQ subgrantee was mandated. The career said it was best practices and it was an Obama um, administration priority. This condition on many grants funded a lot of LGBTQ organizations. So we removed that language and we removed those conditions as we wrote the grants moving forward. Rules and regulations also need ultimate political sign-off and a tremendous amount of political involvement. Your careers may draft initial, you know, the initial documents, the rules and regulations, but there should be multiple political edit edits on the final proposed, any final proposed rule or regulation. The left is excellent about holding up process. So you want to expect and prepare for thousands of comments coming from tons of left-supported groups on any rule that you put up. So expect that and have a plan to deal with those thousands, tens of thousands of comments in order to move the president's agenda. If you are prepared to deal with the comments that are coming in, then you aren't going to let them delay the rule because they have to be responded to each one of the comments. The careers will want to follow the system that's currently in place for handling comments or conditions or how grants are written. You are empowered as a political appointee to adjust these processes as long as you are meeting all legal requirements. So you may have to deal with pushback, but really look at your process and change it. A tip here, in addition to the sheer volume of guidance and conditions to grants and explanations of uh, proposed rules, is to ask careers to explain a grant program or the need for a rule in two sentences. It is astonishing how difficult it is for a career who works in the policy or grant space to actually accomplish this. And finally, use your common sense. Even if you see something that isn't directly addressed by an executive order or an OMB circular or directed by your agency head, 
you want to use your common sense to redact the words and definitions which are weakening our nation. As we have discussed, certain words and phrases used together have hidden definitions. A really good example is social emotional learning. That's actually the new buzzword for CRT or critical race theory. Here's a tip. When you see phrases, any phrase like this, one that sounds innocuous, ask your careers to identify the origin of that phrase. Where did it come from? Why are you using that phrase particularly? What does it mean based on the original intent of those words? And then I would highly recommend you start your own research. As a last note, Plan to read a lot of documents. Know how your careers are implementing the president's executive orders, OMB directives, and be very involved in that process. I can't stress enough the need to control all documents. Create a system where nothing goes out, nothing is published, nothing is put on your website without review by a delegated political or the principal of any office. Ask lots of questions and do not make assumptions. And finally, if a career employee rushes in and says it is an emergency, and I think a lot of people who are an assistant, chief of staff, um, maybe senior advisor or special assistants are going to have careers just descending on them, talking about how it's an emergency that the principal signs something. That's a red flag. Right away, it's a red flag. By the time you get into your position, you will realize that the government moves very, very slowly. Just think about your clearance process and how long that took. These documents need to be read even more carefully. If a career thinks they can push you to sign something by giving it to you at the very last minute, that will become the norm and it will hinder your ability to actually go through a process, read things, edit things, and make sure that they are completely in line with the president's priorities and agenda. The president's agenda will be in peril from your office if you allow this emergency uh, kind of process. Katie, that was great. Thank you for taking us through that process. Do you see the monster is in the attic and it is layered in virtually every document in the federal government. Grant applications, rules, regulations, internal and external policy documents, guidance documents, tweets, speeches, and panels. Every one of these phrases or words that are not corrected by being redacted or rephrased is a failure of the presidency. As the Heritage Foundation's president, Dr. Kevin Roberts, boldly and courageously states in the mandate for leadership, the next conservative president must make the institutions of American civil society hard targets for woke culture warriors. This starts with deleting the terms sexual orientation and gender identity, SOGI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, gender, gender equality, gender equity, gender awareness, gender sensitive, abortion, reproductive health, reproductive rights, and any other term used to deprive Americans of their First Amendment rights out of every federal rule, agency regulation, contract, grant, regulations, and piece of legislation that exists. And the next conservative president will only be able to do so with your help. Are you up for this challenge? We think you are. Together, let's conquer the monsters in Uncle Sam's attic.